Cripple Creek, et cetera. I, I'm not sure you want to record anything I'm about to say, but that's fine. Um, you've got uh, you've got the, the those those jurisdictions are are uh, within the cog, and all sit within um, um, only uh, transportation planning region 14 or uh, Central Front Range. So. If you're one of those jurisdictions, you're going to take a look at this rule with a slightly different eye um, as to what the impact is. Um, I think first and foremost, and again, um, you, you really have to sort of look at how it impacts uh, you first and then maybe look at the region. But as you look at it, at you first, um, you need to sort of look at what are the rules concerning um, how CDOT is going to conduct business and will this have an impact on um, what CDOT is doing? Now, the things that CDOT does as far as um, maintenance and operational type things um, will not be impacted by this. So if that was your only concern, um, I, I think you can still catch the last half hour of Captain Kangaroo. You don't, you don't need to listen to me drone on. But the, but the rest of that is, if your region is planning on growing at some point, um, as CDOT needs to do um, any sort of capacity projects um, within the 10 rural TPRs or the, the 10 non-MPO TPRs, um, you need to pay, pay attention because uh, they are required to have a certain amount of reductions um, statewide, CDOT does, and those uh, reductions have to come someplace. Now, I think part of it is that they only have to model 10 years worth of projects at a time with a 10 year plan um, versus the MPOs that have a 30 year plan. But at some point, if somebody sort of says, hey, wait a minute, we, we still don't, we don't have the same sort of picture um, for CDOT as we do the MPOs, and they're required to do that 30 year plan, um, it could have an impact on, on that. But again, it depends on what your strategic plan for your, your area is. If you uh, like to uh, make sure you don't, you don't have growth, uh, then again, it probably isn't going to impact you. Um, but things that you're looking to um, urbanize corridors or things like that, um, it could very well have a, an impact, especially if the transportation network for that corridor um, is the state facility. Um, took about 20 minutes too long on that slide. So we'll just wrap it up with, um, then we have sort of, there's jurisdictions that are in the MPO, only but not the PPRTA. So that's Woodland Park, Teller County, Fountain, Palmer Lake, Monument. Um, these will have uh, an impact on you to the extent that uh, the uh, long range plan, um, as we model it, if it's not showing the reductions that are necessary, um, we may need to, to move uh, uh, projects out. Um, PPRT only, um, REMA, uh, again, if, if you're on the line, you guys might want to consider um, looking at how this impacts the PPRTA. Um, offhand, there's not a direct impact, but the indirect impacts are that the, the projects need to be modeled and counted towards the greenhouse gas um, inventory. We may find ourselves in a bit of an issue where we have to choose between PPRTA projects MPO projects and even uh, CDOT projects because CDOT projects that are uh, being constructed within the urban area um, count against that urban area. So our budget would include all of those capacity building projects for PPRTA, uh, the MPO and CDOT. So uh, that could be an indirect concern. As far as directly, um, there's, there doesn't seem to be an impact. Holly, go ahead, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, so I think this is one of the um, main reasons why I would encourage, and I hate to throw this out there, but, you know, sorry, Rick, uh, I would encourage Woodland Park, Teller County, Fountain, Palmer Lake, and Monument to seriously look at joining or forming their own RTA. And Woodland Park and, and Teller could actually form their own. So that's just a sidebar that becomes a, quite problematic because of where we're at in the process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. 
I'll pause a second, see if there's anything else. And then we'll just keep rolling because I've, like I said, got a lot of, I got a lot of stuff to stuff in here. Uh, and then finally, if you're El Paso County, Colorado Springs, Manitou Springs, Green Mountain Falls, you belong to both PPRTA and the MPO. Um, and so I, I saw that Victoria was on here earlier. You know, uh, you've got the what you're doing. You've you've got sort of the worst of both worlds. You got to just you got to figure out what's going on and what the impact is um, in your the rural parts of El Paso County, um, and yet still keep an eye on the impact of addressing the the uh, the growing urban area of unincorporated El Paso County that's within the MPO. So um, you got to have sort of both. If you're any one of those four jurisdictions, you have to sort of look at both. Um, next slide, please. CDOT on their website has a uh, frequently asked questions. Um, I wanted to make sure I pulled this one out. Um, how does the proposed rule impact projects funded with local dollars, such as a regional transportation authority? But again, I, I will stress that it's any local dollars, which would include if you're a jurisdiction that is uh, going to run a uh, bond uh, um, proposal at, at one of your, you know, at, at, a, at an election or whatever. So it's that it has to that the bottom line of the, re, the response is that all it can impact is the federal dollars. So for uh, Pikes Peak, we've got a little over $10 million in uh, surface transportation uh, uh, project money that comes from the feds or STP, um, as well as transportation alternatives program or TAP funds that come from the feds. Those are the two funding sources that can be impacted and have uh, and be diverted over. This is their answer here is basically they cannot prevent or stop PPRTA from doing what they need to do. Now, again, back to the modeling thing, if PPRTA uh, does a certain amount of projects and that counts against our GHG cap, uh, that again, indirectly limits um, what we might be able to do um, in CDOT region two within the MPO um, or some of our, our other do dollars. But I did wanna make sure that I hit that. If there's no questions, we're gonna move on to the next slide. A developer project, uh, the, the question from Rick here in, in the room is, what about developer projects? From our point of view, Rick, uh, developer money counts as local. So that's, so just like a, uh, a PPRTA or a, a bond or other local city or town initiative, that local money would sort of count as local and would roll in there. Yes. Yes, it will. It would still be model and count against our GHG cap. Yes, sir. Um, the other other uh, FAQ that we wanted to pull out from the uh, C dot uh, uh, website was the what is what is regionally what is a regionally significant project. And they, they say here that again, the, the concept is to share the proposed rule focuses on projects that fundamentally change the transportation system. Again, um, they're trying to make sure that they're not getting into a place that uh, uh, sort of, again, micromanages maintenance or operations, but is really truly looking at um, those big projects that have an impact um, when you're doing something. So uh, next slide, please. So a reasonably significant project in the rule, they've basically pulled out the, the, um, the federal definition uh, and, and it would normally be included in the modeling of metropolitan transportation network or state transportation network included at a minimum all principal arterial highways and then all fixed guideway transit. So um, the one thing I wanted to point out to you is this is slightly different uh, than the um, a uh, definition of reasonably significant we're using within the PPACG region. Um, if you go to page six of our 22 to 25 PPACG tip uh, document um, on page six, it says a reasonably significant project is defined as um, reasonably significant projects must be included in the tip in accordance to the, with current federal planning regulations. Projects are defined as reasonably significant if they are one, uh, projects regardless of funding source that require action by FHW or FTA or two are funded with federal funds other than those administered by FHW or FTA. So 
slightly different, but the upshot of this is basically um, our more um, uh, more bigger, eh, our bigger, our, our bigger uh, 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 projects are going to be that. And at this point, Will, did, did you want to talk about that briefly? Did you want uh, Jess to call up your map? No, I think let's move on and I mean, we can come back to that if anybody's any got specific questions about what qualifies. All right, uh, next place, uh, slide please, Jess. So now we're gonna get into a little bit of some of the things that if you are gonna sit down and write a letter um, or make a comment to uh, the, uh, uh, the process. And again, the um, uh, last day for comments is um, October 15th. Um, so I've got the, the sort of this matrix broken down to PPACG. So those are the, this is the things that, that Andy and I are gonna chat about when, when we write our letter. Uh, PPRTA jurisdictions, um, you have, again, uh, back to the, the evil eye of, of, of PPACG, you guys have a little bit of different uh, take on some things and you have different priorities. Um, and then I have a column for MPO jurisdictions and non-MPO jurisdictions. Uh, so you guys can sort of uh, kind of see what, what makes sense for you to, to comment on. Um, one thing that as we've had verbal conversations, invariably, it always goes back to the legislation. Things like should have gone to the voters, uh, populations coming from China and Canada and California, uh, the, uh, the, the, the big three of, of folks that, that we want to <laughs> pollution. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, things like that. All of that is, is all very valid, but for the rulemaking, Think of it as a court of law, right? If they said, uh, we're going to uh, uh, um, pass a law that said you can't wear a coat and you wear a coat, when you're, when you're going into the court of law, you wanna talk about were you in fact wearing a coat? Is it, was it more of a slicker or something else, right? You wanna talk about the, uh, the merits of the particular case, not the merits of the overall law. So for our particular letter, we're not going to get into that because, uh, you know, quite frankly, I could probably do a page and a half of that. Um, and just a quick aside, for any letters you want to send, you want to hit the high points and, and make your point, um, but you don't necessarily want to have it be a five page, uh, you know, uh, of reiterating things that they might have heard from other folks. So um, before we go on, I see uh, Commissioner Williams, you have your you, you have another comment. Yes, I do again. So on the California and, and the air, air quality coming from other countries, the unfortunate thing is we can't control what California does. We cannot control what China does. So I would totally leave those arguments out. Um, you need to stick to the arguments very specifically related to Colorado. We've been behind on our roads for 15 years. Um, we've tried to address it before, we haven't. And so we're starting behind already. And now we're trying to uh, regulate the building of our roads to a point where we can't build them. And we're already 15 years behind. So those are the kind of things that would make an impact. Going into the political side of it, uh, right now, it's just not an effective argument. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner. And again, I, I for PPACG, that's exactly why I said no. However, it's not my place to tell jurisdictions if they win and they want to make their uh, their political statements uh, and and take a stand on on things. So if if that is something you want to include in your comments, I, I, again, feel free to do that. But um, it's not something that we're going to include in ours. Uh, the next row I have there could impact PPRTA projects. So again. Um, even though we don't think it will do it directly, I think there is an indirect impact. So we'll touch on that a little bit in our letter. If you're a PPRTA jurisdiction, you certainly should um, have your concerns uh, noted and on the record. And then if you're uh, an, you know, anybody other than PPRTA, that's at your discretion if you wanna do it. Um, support, if we all support each other, I, that would be great. But again, uh, as individual jurisdictions, you have your own, um, philosophies that you need to afford as well as your other sorts of things. So that's why I put you at your discretion. 
uh, modeling. Uh, again, we believe that they're not using appropriate assumptions. You know, every time I, I, I turn around, uh, there's the, a new a thing with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, induced demand or something. So uh, I do not agree with their modeling assumptions and we do not think they're appropriate. Um, so Will and, and I and, and Andy will talk about that in our PPACG letter. Um, but for the you as the jurisdictions, uh, that is a 50,000 foot well, um, and I don't think you want to go down it. So uh, you, you don't need to worry about the technical stuff. We'll take care of it. And it's probably something that is not uh, 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 appropriate, or I shouldn't say appropriate, but something that you don't need to concern your limited amount of uh, uh, paper space on as we'll address it. Um, as far as authority, um, uh, We'll touch on this a little bit, but these are things that if you feel it's appropriate, I, I think those are things um, that the Transportation Commission and others need to hear because they're certainly hearing from folks that saying, well, the rule doesn't go far enough. We're not curtailing how people drive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, things like the rule usurps the jurisdiction's authority to select projects that are best for their jurisdiction. Um, again, I'm not trying to paint this with a broad brush, but a lot of the folks who um, um, sort of put the parameters on this are from Denver and look at how uh, Denver looks at problems uh, and solves problems. And again, it's unfortunate because that, that one size fits all solution when the solution is based on Denver doesn't usually work very well in the rest of Colorado and the Colorado way of life. So I think that is a very um, uh, appropriate tack for, for some of the jurisdictions to take to point out again, uh, we don't have the same sort of densities, we don't have the same sort of transit system, etc. cetera. Um, and so I think that would be inappropriate. Um, the rules disappoint in application, there's no credit for region uh, with good or improving air quality. I think that's a, a, a statement you all can make. The argument that we hear from um, the uh, proponents of, of having a very strict rule is, well, look, uh, Denver's doing things that are good, but even then they are having decreasing air quality. They've moved into the, uh, the from the fourth to the fifth level of bad air quality. Um, and so even though they're doing these things, it's only getting worse. So we have to hold them constant at the good things they're doing and make them do more good things. Very valid argument. If you're Denver, if you're Colorado Springs, you're like, well, we've been doing good things and we've moved actually out of maintenance into attainment. So we are not getting the credit, nor is the rest of the state, quite frankly, the credit for the good things that they're doing and the fact that they're on the upswing. If you're on the downswing and you wanna make that argument that you're not doing enough, I think that's appropriate. But the rest of the state's on that upswing and actually has a very good air quality in some places. So I think, that in this particular case, by painting us all with this broad brush of, uh, well, Denver's not doing enough, so we all need to do more, is not appropriate. And I think that would be an appropriate point for you all to make in your letters. Um, and then finally, these are the three things that we're gonna talk about next. And um, as we talk about them, um, if there are any points that you, uh, that resonate with you or your particular jurisdiction, uh, feel free to include them in the uh, in your correspondence or your comments to the Transportation Commission. Um, the uh, analysis requirements, um, we believe that the, the a Transportation Improvement Program or TIP document adoption should not be included. Um, and one of the things is first, all of the projects that are within the TIP have to be included in the long range plan by definition. And if we've already balanced the long range plan, uh, the TIP uh, by extension should be okay over that long term period. It is by saying that it has to include the TIP, that there are two questions is first, um, what, uh, uh, what year do you use and do you, do you prorate to the year or, or what? It, ha having a document is, that's adopted only four years and is only a partial of the picture is not appropriate to judge against um, a document that is 20 plus years 
um, over a 30 year period. So they're just sort of apples and oranges and one is already dependent on the other. Um, and if it passes the way it is, all it does is answer far more questions uh, than have been answered. But we'll, we'll get into that as we move forward. Uh, GHG, GHG mitigation measures. Uh, this is probably, I think, uh, uh, the, the big one. If the, the mitigation measures are done in a meaningful way where if you do a mitigation project and you get proper credit for it, um, this rule could actually be very workable and we can live with it. If the mitigation measures are like, well, we want you to do all this stuff and you'll, you'll address it in your, your, your thing, but you don't really get um, very much credit for doing it, um, then it, looking at the, the modeling, and, and will correct me if I'm wrong, it will be neon impossible uh, for us to uh, model to where we need to be. Uh, so at, at that point, um, it, it's not very helpful. Andy? Yeah, yeah just another um, kind of add, add on to that comment. Um, we've got a really good working relationship with CDOT and we really value that, but they're, they're in a tough spot. So they've got to make this overall effort, I think, meaningful where they are going to show some emissions reductions. But one challenge that, that uh, John and I have faced and talking about this with our other MPO partners as well is that the mitigation um, credits, if you will, what the measures are going to really be valued at aren't coming out until um, spring sometime, I think March or April, April. which is, is fine. On the one hand, we don't want those embedded within this rulemaking necessarily, because that makes it more difficult to make changes if changes had to be made to those mitigation measures and how much each one is valued at. Um, but not knowing, you know, we have no idea how much a new transit route is going to be valued or uh, van pools that are set up or a new uh, a bus stop and, and things like that. So it puts us in a really awkward situation where we have no idea if we can even meet these requirements since we don't have that other big part of the picture uh, yet. So we want to keep it separate from the rulemaking, but um, would, sure would be nice to really know what that's going to look like before decisions made on, on this overall rule, if that makes sense. Okay. Like I said, yeah, you know, we trust CDOT, but you know, the folks we're talking with at CDOT right now, they're not going to be there forever. So um, we, we'd like to get a little more certainty around what this is going to look like. And I, I'll pause for a second. Not hearing anybody uh, chiming in. Uh, and, and the last one is that we'll, we'll chat about here is the waiver. Uh, at first, when this process started, it was very hard and fast. No, the, this is what the rule is, period and you can't do anything. And a lot of us at, at the NPOs were like, you know, um, when, when you look at things like the, oh, I don't know, the I-25 gap, right? That was a project uh, that everyone said, for safety reasons, we need to do this. You know, we've got to have a couple of troopers killed. We've got to do this project. Um, everybody put their, uh, their nose to the grindstone and, and CDOT did a terrific job in, in getting that cleared and um, getting it built. And here we are just what, you know, three or four years later, and it's, you know, coming up to, to being completed. However, I know because it was just as I was getting here, uh, we had to put that project into our tip, and I believe Dr. Cog had to put it in their tip as well. Well, right now, if we had to put that project in and we had to do that modeling, we could say, I'm sorry, this is a great safety project, and it's a shame that people are dying. However, we're not allowed to do it because uh, it's a capacity increasing project uh, that will increase GHG. I think cooler heads finally prevailed and they realized, okay, well, that's somewhat of a good example. There are, there are things like you know, safety projects and um, economic development projects. So we will have a, a, a waiver process in there. However, when you read the waiver process and we'll go into this in more detail, it basically, uh, um, again, how it's being interpreted could, again, severely tie the hands of the transportation commission instead of, uh, making having humans make decisions uh, based on what's best for the state, it will then uh, basically have a model, uh, a black box of, of data in a computer uh, make decisions and lock us into it. And again, I'm hoping for you know the latter that 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 the Transportation Commission <laughs> will have the ability to make good decisions um, based on the facts of the situation uh, versus being locked into what some computer tells them, oh, and by the way, uh, the, the, the model is all based on human assumptions in the first place. So um, that is another thing that I think it would be appropriate for people to sort of hit on and say, yeah, do not um, handicap or in any way decrease the ability of real human beings with an intelligence uh, to make good decisions 
uh, for what's best for Colorado. So that's the letter section. So if we could move on to the next slide. And this is where I'm gonna sort of talk about the impact on our, our process. So um, this is a slide we stole from Dr. Cog, uh, but again, it just sort of says, hey, for those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, the NPO's role is, you know, we do the, the, uh, the, the planning, we, we coordinate the comprehensive planning for the, the area. So El Paso County still does theirs, Fountain still does their planning, Colorado Springs, obviously. Our job is just to get them uh, to coordinate and make sure that it, um, it all makes sense, right? And so we identify, evaluate alternatives, and we, we, we look at um, doing things that are, we already have federal requirements about the um, environment as well as economic development and state of good repair and those sorts of things of the 10 planning factors. Um, again, we're required to do the 10 year plan, um, uh, cover at least 20 years and have it updated every five for us. The slide there says Dr. Cog is Dr. Cog is four because they're in non-attainment, but because we're in attainment, our update is actually due every five years and that we're, we're required to uh, do a tip. Now, I think from looking at some of the names on there, I think most of you already knew this, but just setting the stage. Next slide, please. So again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over all of this, but basically our process is we have a vision of goals. We know where we wanna, we look. Um, we look at our, our, we model the baseline. We review previous RTP projects. We develop our financial plan and then all of the jurisdictions sort of look at what projects kind of fit within those vision and goals for not only the region, but for their individual jurisdictions, what they've already done to date. And then they submit their applications um, for either more money for existing projects or changes of scope of new of existing projects, as well as any new projects they might wanna do. We go through a project review process. We score the projects. Uh, we review for the performance to a draft plan. We model for compliance. And at this point, because we're in attainment, our only um, requirement is for Title VI, i.e. that we're not putting all of the, all of the good projects in certain parts of town and all of the bad projects um, where the protected communities are. Uh, we, have a, we, we do pretty well at that, and I don't think we haven't had much need to change very many things. Um, so you get Title VI planets, you have your draft plan, you go through the public outreach. If all of the public shows up and says, we don't, we don't wanna see um, this particular project uh, in, the, in our neighborhood, uh, then maybe the plan needs to be changed. So then we go back through the circle again, but if not, goes through public comment period and the plan gets ado uh, adopted. Next slide, please. This slide kind of shows where we think um, we'll have some sort of impact um, based on the um, thing. Don't worry about moving the, the box, Jess. I'm gonna kind of talk about that big box anyway. So with this, now obviously our vision and goals, add emphasis to GHG. That's not a problem, happy to do it. Um, that doesn't really get into it. Uh, with a view, re, review of existing anticipated challenges, again, we, we can add more GHG sort of stuff into that process. Again, is not a huge deal. Um, and again, I, I think most everybody is like, yeah, if we can do things that promote clean air, uh, we definitely want to do it. Um, as we go through our process, then you see now when we model for conformity, uh, in addition to Title VI, which is the federal requirement, we now have to do the GHG conformity. The GHG conformity compliance, this is where it becomes very tough because again, it depends on how all of the modeling works out and the, and the baseline and the credits that were given for uh, uh, non-capacity projects. Because you have to remember that non-capacity projects, when you put them into the model or you, or you look at what their impact is on the model, a lot of that is human-based decision based on how that non-capacity project will impact it. So if we're, re if we're required by CDOT to, to adjust our model a certain way, that has an impact. Or as we run through the model, this kind of goes off to that big box that's kind of covered by my, my picture there. Uh, again, the, the, the process is you model, if you don't meet your compliance, you take out some of your capacity projects, you add non-capacity projects, and if you don't make it uh, back and forth, well, then you could literally spend all of your money on non-capacity projects uh, to get into compliance. So 
this is where when I talked about before those mitigation uh, measures, if those are things that we're giving meaningful credit for, um, it could sort of be the best of both worlds. One, we're we're still saving the environment and and, and doing uh, the the good things and providing travel choice, but also providing capacity projects. Um, this is again the other thing that kind of drives me crazy is we really have to fight hard to show that capacity projects can actually improve air quality. Um, if I've got a project where uh, right now people are driving three three miles out of their way and taking an extra ten minutes uh, to get from point A to point B, and then we either widen the road or create a new road that makes it a more direct shot from point A to point B. In my mind, uh, that means you've improved air quality because the, the cars are on the road 10 minutes less and um, they drive a shorter distance. However, uh, due to my favorite thing, induced demand, CDOT's saying, well, no, 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 that, that's not really it. it, it it's gonna just get congested anyway and the problem's even just gonna get worse. And again, I think that is just like pokes a stick in the eye of common sense. Um, so I am never going to agree with CDOT on that particular issue. Um, and I think it's a shame uh, that uh, that is the, the the stance that people are taking. But uh, that's where we also have to sort of uh, take a stand and say, roads are not necessarily a bad thing. And, you, and, we, and we have to sort of fight for that. Andy? It, well, and just to amplify that just a little bit, and this isn't just a theoretical uh, concern that we have. Uh, one project that has been kicked around for a while and hopefully it's going to be funded fairly soon is the North Powers extension over to I-25. We feel, and we would argue this with CDOT, that that is going to reduce travel and improve emissions and and so forth. Does, does it mean more people are going to travel through that area? Of course, but I think overall net that's going to be a positive for uh, emissions. Kind of gets to another concern we've got where we've got a um, according to the draft rules, execute an IGA with CDOT and with CDPHE before we start our plan update, where we agree on what our model assumptions are. And that's going to be really problematic. We'll probably point that out in our letter back to um, the Transportation Commission on this, because we're, we're concerned about what if we don't agree on what those assumptions are going to be, if it's induced demand, but we know we've got a project like this that is going to improve emissions overall, um, uh, that could be a, a real uh, friction point. Um, I know there were other assumptions built into the um, emissions reductions overall that CDOT came up with where they're assuming, I think about a 6% increase in transit ridership year over year for a number of years, things like that we don't feel are really realistic. So that's gonna be a real uh, concern just having to execute an IGA like that. And I know Craig and, and Brian would like to see, you know, 6% increase year over year, but we're not sure that that is again, a, a realistic uh, a thing. And we have to identify where the funding comes from. Um, next, so that is, so this sort of ends our section where we sort of take about what's our existing process, how we think it will impact <coughs> our, our, our process after it passes. Um, so pause for a second, see if there's any comments. Otherwise we'll move on to the next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, this is now we're I think this is the the last part of our of our 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 chat here is to sort of review the rule um, and the different sections. So one uh, and then Will, if you you can help me out with this, that'd be appreciated. One, so I could take a drink and and uh, but uh, two, I think you understand a little better than I do. Um, so uh, again, this is goes from the uh, the C dot uh, Q and A thing. Um, and how did CDOT determine how to set the GHG pollution levels? So um, they basically uh, did the modeling and they looked at uh, non-vehicle trip reduction with biking, walking, and from home. Uh, then they looked at a regular increase in transit service. This is the 6% um, uh, year over year that Andy was talking about. And then they looked at changes, changes in land use and facilitate reduction in vehicular trips. Now, I think CDOT knows that, that uh, land use is the purview of local governments. Um, so I think that they sort of uh, estimated a reduction from all three of the scenarios along um, with VMT to set the GHG reductions in the, in the table that, uh, that you'll see next. Um, and the decision how to comply is with each MPO and, and CDOT. So the next slide real quick. So this is, this is the, the reduction levels. Um, so you've got PPACG, we're the third one down there. Our 2025 baseline is 2.7 metric tons of greenhouse gas. Um, we're not required to do 2025 uh, because we are currently in attainment. Uh, the 2023 baseline 
is um, uh, 2.2, um, and the reduction level um, there that you see is like uh, 0 0.15. But um, how you get to 0 0.15, uh, is that removing every single project? Is that removing only one road widening? Um, Will, can, can you help us sort of determine, uh, make heads or tails of what some of these numbers actually mean as far as um, selecting real projects in real life? Oh, is he, he's muted or he's not, are you there, Will? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, still muted. Um, you know, unfortunately we can't really correlate these to real, to real projects or tangibles because we've never had to do GHG modeling um, in the Pikes Peak region before. Um, we can translate or kind of correlate these to, to VMT um, based on our, our current network. And in order to hit some of these targets, we're looking at, for example, when we crunched the 2030 numbers, um, you know, our baseline that they have set was 2.2 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. Um, so that's CO2E. And that's going to mean that when they run it into moves, um, the EPA emissions model, they are looking for um, not just carbon dioxide, but other greenhouse gases, um, such as um, NO2, as well as um, um, methane and, um, and really anything that, that they want to roll into what's going to be considered a greenhouse gas. And they're going to call it a, a carbon dioxide equivalent. And there's a formula for that to, to crunch in. And kind of going back to the previous slide, what they use to set the baseline in these reduction levels is actually a different model and a different system than what we're going to be evaluated using in the future, which is one of our biggest um, issues with this from a modeling perspective, is they use the EARPAT model um, from FHWA, which was developed by Cambridge Systematics, and they use the statewide travel demand model along with EARPAT to kind of set up this baseline. But going forward, we're going to have to submit our projects, uh, and they're going to use the EPA's MOVES model to then determine how well we've met this. Uh, have, we, have we been able to reduce our greenhouse gas equivalent uh, production, again, with those different greenhouse gases and then normalize to what they call a carbon dioxide equivalent? And the way those two models function are, are different. They're not the same. Um, so it's like we're using one standard to set the baseline, and then we're going to be using another standard going forward in order to determine compliance. Um, that being said, working with the EPA's um, online tools to try and get an estimate of hitting our 0.15 uh, reduction level for 2030. Um, that's about right now with our existing model, we would have to pull a, about a million, uh, just over a million uh, vehicle miles traveled off the network. So that's about the best thing that I can put, put out there in terms of an equivalency. We can't really, again, right now relate that to specific projects because A, we've now done greenhouse gas modeling, but again, we don't really know what our mitigation projects are gonna be um, and what the impact is gonna be because that hasn't been released yet by CDOT. So we have a lot of projects in our region that go through the tip that would probably be considered mitigation that will reduce um, our CO2 equivalent and help us hit our budget. We just don't know what the amount, you know, what those projects are gonna, uh, how they're gonna quantify that. So for example, improving transit through Mountain Metro, um, improving our sidewalk capacity through the region, things like that, we know will help mitigate and count towards that reduction, but we have not been given specifics on, again, how to quantify those reductions yet. Uh, thanks, Well, Hey, Victoria, you have a question? Thank you, yes, I do. Hey, Will, do you know what our total VMT is for the region? So what part of that 1 million is? is reductions to what number? Yeah, it's a good question, Victoria. Give me a second here and I'll look that up. I've got that handy. All right, well, he's looking that up. If there, are there any other questions on this particular thing? Oh, yeah, so we have a question here in the studio audience. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, Rick Sonnenberg here. I just wanted to ask if, um, Mill and overlay 
maintenance or um, replacing a bridge without adding lanes or reconstructing a road without adding lanes, do any of those count against the greenhouse gas? No, In they the do not add capacity. So the model, if you modeled them before all those projects, you model them afterwards, it should be exactly the same. Okay, so it's a wash, it doesn't hurt anything. No. Okay. And Will, I stalled yep. as long as I can. All right, no worries. Yeah, so we've got um, our VMT from the last forecast, the 2045 uh, Long Range Transportation Plan. Uh, and I can email this out to you as well, Victoria. So for 2030, um, it's just about 17 and a half million uh, vehicle miles traveled in our network. And then by the time we get to 2045, we're looking at just a hair over 19 million uh, vehicle miles traveled. So, well, thanks, Will. This... Sorry, thanks, Will. And an email would be great. Yep. Hi, hi Will. This is Todd Frisbee with the city of Carl Springs. Hey, Todd. Uh, the question, so um, the tw my question is, so you have, you said of roughly 19 million in, in 2030. So is, is it a 1 million reduction from the 19 million or is it a 1 million reduction from the 17 million? Just... Yeah, well, that's the kicker. We still have to keep reducing each, each year. Um, okay. And again, I, I, I want to be cautious to say that CDOT has reiterated that we're not trying to necessarily reduce VMT. Um, VMT is about the only way that I can correlate it. So if we take what they've come up with in our baseline and then figure, okay, for me, you know, mile traveled within our network, this is how um, this is how much GHG basically each mile is generating to come up with, say our 2.2 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. If we had to hit that 0.15 reduction, then that's about you know a million miles that we would have to cut out. Um, but there's going to be, like I said, other factors that go into this. Um, so it's it's not strictly a VMT reduction, and I, I just want to emphasize that. However, just to kind of put it in perspective, that um, yes, you know, for each for each year, we're going to have to continue to cut back in some way, and that's really the challenge when we look at this. So for 2030, we have about 17 and a half million miles. We need to cut down about 1.1 just by that 2030. Um, and considering that the population is expected to, to grow um, year after year, um, that's, that's gonna be our bigger issue is even if we don't expand the network, we're still gonna have more vehicle miles travel because we're gonna continue to add vehicles on the network, obviously because of growth. And so we're really fighting that uphill battle um, so the bigger, the biggest reductions that we can see in GHG, and this is this has been shown from modeling, both from Cambridge Systematics, who came up with the baselines using their AirPAT tool, but also with Dr. Cog and North Front Range MPO, who have to do greenhouse gas uh, emissions for their air quality um, compliance measures, is is really not a reduction in the network capacity. It really comes down to changes in land use and the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, those are by far and away the two largest factors to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but what's being put on us here at the MPO is to try and use our modeling and our plans to restrict project selection. And it's, it's really not an effective way um, to try and limit greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles. And, and that's kind of the uphill battle that we're facing, especially in light of increasing population over the next you know, 20, 30 years. Oh, okay, thanks, Will. I, you, I had two follow-up questions, but you answered both. One was related to population and one was, is there credit for you know, changing in technology in terms of uh, you know, electrification of the vehicle fleet, things like that. So, so we're good, thank you. Sure. All right. And so just moving on. But again, re remember, it, roads don't cause people to drive on them. People cause people to drive on them. And so our, unless our network shrinks and we have a decrease in population, the numbers are just going to grow uh, because it's not, it's not the uh, ability to have road, way, roads available that causes it, it's, it's, it's the folks. So just keep that in mind that again, um, it's sort of making the assumption that if, if we stop building roads, congestion will so, get so bad that people will stop driving 
And I think we've seen uh, year after year, season after season, that's just not the case. But unfortunately, again, that's part of what we're, we're dealing with here. Um, so we're now into the home stretch of we've got the three sort of things that we want to uh, the focus on. So uh, next rule, please. That's next rule. <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> Um, is again, this is where we were talking about the tip. So in their definitions, that first box is a, a definition of a, an applicable planning document, and you can see it includes tips. And then later on in rule, uh, part, in section eight of the rule, it says when adopting or amending applicable documents, so go up to applicable documents, that's where you have the tip, uh, the, 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 the MPO shall conduct an GHG analysis. So again, this is where we're talking about um, they're going to require when we adopt a new tip uh, that we would need to um, have uh, uh, do an analysis. But again, what are we analyzing against? If we're analyzing against the long range plan, well, the long range plan hasn't changed. So um, unless they're going to somehow change what our, um, how it's measured, um, including the tips uh, does not make sense. And so again, uh, that is something that we'll comment on and, and hopefully again, um, within your letter, uh, uh, your comments, you can as well. So the ne next slide is still on the same topic and it's just how Dr. Cog addressed it. Next slide, please. Um, and they talk about um, whether the, how can tips uh, be used and again, um, when a tip does not align with the rules horizon years, um, how will it be you know, assessed against the, the, the next closest or all of them or, or what? Uh, so again, I think our, our friends up north at Dr. Cog um, will also make a comment that uh, uh, including the tip is not appropriate and uh, it should be removed. Um, so that's number one of the three. Before I move on, are, is there any questions? <clears throat> Victoria, I see your hands up, but I think that might be from before, but just in case I, I wanna check. No, that was from before. All right, thanks. So if nothing else on this one, then we'll move on to the next slide, please. And I do is... have one question. Sure, go ahead, Commissioner. And then I do have to leave. Well, you're um, in the car, so we can see you're ready to leave. Yeah, I am. So my question would be, and this is just a consideration, it can be answered offline. Do we have any chance of advocating to postpone the deadline to enforce these, to adopt these standards until January 1, 2024 or 2025. It just doesn't make sense that we're having to do it starting on January, 2022. That doesn't fit in with our process. So if I understand the question correctly, again, there's, there's staggered compliance. The way the legislation is written, um, SB 260, um, it requires this rule to be in place for North Front Range and Dr. Cog uh, to uh, be in compliance and, and check their uh, 2025 numbers. We are, in fact, because we are uh, um, not hitting those 2025 numbers, we're required to look at the 2030 numbers. I think the upshot of that is, um, yes, it will apply to us in 2024, 2025. So I think we've already get that as as PPACG. So Andy, did I get that right? I, I think so. I don't know all the deadlines involved with it, but that that sounds right. I mean, I, but I would say I think that's a really good point, Commissioner. And I think if we could advocate for a little more time, just so we have a better understanding as to how this is going to work, just from a practical standpoint, that would be super helpful. And also, if we had some more time, so we could see what the mitigation measures values are going to be as well how those are going to be quantified, that would definitely help us too. So we have a more complete picture as to how this is all going to work together. Um, so I think that'll be part of our commentary. Uh, Commissioner Hickey, um, your, your name popped up towards the top. I don't know if that means you have a comment and I'm glad you're still with us. I thought you had left. Oh, maybe she's, are you there, Commissioner? Hi, uh, sorry, John. I um, don't have a comment. Really appreciate the discussion. It's very informative. And as I said, do put what you can in your written comments. Thank you very much. Uh, will do. Thank you. And I apologize for putting you on the spot. I thought you had gone and then I saw your name pop up to the top. So I thought maybe you were trying to talk. So uh, sorry about that. All right. So uh, hopefully, Commissioner, uh, that answered, uh, uh, um, Commissioner Williams, that answered your question. 
anything else? Let's see, we've got uh, Tim Roberts has a question in the chat. Is the credit for enhanced transit and how would VMT reduction be, uh, be measured? So, um, so, uh, so I think that's actually part of what we're gonna talk about now, Tim, is the, uh, the mitigation measures, is that correct? Do you have access to a microphone, Tim? I want to make sure I understand the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, um, you're right. Um, okay, so uh, let me take one Ron, step back and then we'll get to Tim. Oh, go ahead, Will. I just wanted to bring it in that that, um, I think also to, to help answer Tim's question is that was something that was considered and that was put into the, when they did the baseline calculation. So those scenarios that CDOT already ran when they came up with our baseline considered one, an increase um, in um, transit ridership, and, and as well as electrification of the transit fleet and a reduction uh, in transit costs to encourage that ridership. So there are some things in terms of um, you know, transit and the electrification of transit services that were already baked into the baseline that, we are, that we're expected to meet. And then we would have to come up with whatever they come up with mitigations would have to stand on top of that. Okay, yep, yeah, thank you, okay, Will. thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Will. So uh, again, we've already sort of started on it. Our second of three is the GHG mitigation measures. Again, in my mind, for whatever that's worth, um, is sort of the heart of this. This is where um, if they go too far to one, one way, uh, the, the rule, rule will be un, unworkable if they go too far in the other uh, direction, um, it, it, you know, they've really got to sort of hit this correct. Uh, but if they do this correctly um, and we're able to do, you know, a few projects and still be able to do um, uh, uh, meaningful capacity, safety, and um, economic development type projects, uh, this, is, this is where it sort of works. So, they provide sort of this understanding of the different things in the interest of time. I'm not going to read through them, but Andy sort of already hit on this, right? That here's here's the here's the kicker, though. <laughs> we're we're commenting on a rule. This is the most important part of the rule, but how it's actually going to work is not part of this, and we'll come back again in April of uh, next year. Yeah, I'm not sure what else we need to say about that specifically. Just we don't know how beneficial putting these mitigation measures in place is going to be. And that's really concerning. Another concern here too, and I think Will alluded to this, is that the biggest change in reducing VMT in the future that we've all found from a modeling standpoint is if you change our, our land use scenarios and we have zero control over that. So not clear how that, if that happens in a planning process, how that gets credited and this effort, so there's a little bit of murkiness around that, but um, the fact that we as an MPO could be held accountable for complying with the rule, especially with the major mitigation measure that we have no control over, um, just a lot of, lot of concern there. Yeah. So, um, and before we leave this again, I think as far as what the comment is coming from uh, you, the jurisdictions, you know, I think if you talk about 8.03 and, and just say, you know, there's an opportunity here for, uh, uh, substantial or significant weight to be given to mitigation projects. Um, so therefore, um, we can continue to do positive things um, without it, it totally uh, shifting all of the focus away from economic development and safety um, and other things where we are uh, uh, not necessarily getting the gains in um, environmental uh, uh, benefits that we think we are, um, something along those lines. Uh, because again, as an aside, um, I, I think some of these rules might actually do the opposite of what they're, they're thinking. They won't allow us to do uh, positive sort of capacity projects that do improve the environment, as well as they do sort of incentivize or push um, sprawl out to the non-urban areas, uh, which again, I think it is, is not what they're intending uh, but sort of what they're setting up, but that's probably nothing to be put in any sort of <laughs> official comment, but that's just my take on it. <laughs> so our third and final thing, if we can move on to the next one, 
Oh, and I think actually I do have a slide in here about how the, the rule was being adopted by Dr. Cog. Uh, they say basically, again, the same thing. Again, how and how are they getting um, credit for this and how are the mitigations you know, reported an annually and those sorts of things. So all, all very good, good questions. Uh, so now we'll move on to our third and final one. I apologize that we've, we've gone over about, about five minutes, but uh, this is the last one is again, what I talked about earlier on the um, next slide, please. Sorry, um, is the, uh, the, uh, the waiver. And again, uh, this is the language 8.05 may request a waiver. So you're like, yay, all right, we can request a waiver. We're not locked into what a black box tells us to do. And then the very next one is like, well, you, you, you but in total, but uh, you know, uh, in no case shall a waiver be granted if such a waiver results in a substantial increase of GHG. Well, what do they mean by substantial? Uh, and again, it's taking the ability to make um, the correct decision out of the hands of human beings and putting it into, a, a, a black box computer model uh, that, by the way, is all based on assumptions from some from a lot of data, but human beings on how that data is being um, um, utilized and um, applied. So, um, with with that, we have one last slide on the waiver, which I, I think I stole from Dr. Cog. Um, oh, excuse me, I stole it from uh, well, I stole one from North Front Range. And again, they, they pretty much uh, say the same thing. Uh, can they, that uh, you're, you're basically locked in, although there is a, a thing for uh, that the Transportation Commission can reconsider a non-compliance determination, um, how, if the requirements are met and the Transportation Commission has 30 days uh, to act if no accentation of the request is denied. So again, I think North Front Range's point there is like, oh, well, this is a very difficult decision. Let's just not do anything. Or if, if even if it's a good decision, but they can't make the schedule, it's automatically denied, not automatically accepted, which is what you normally see in these things. Andy? Yeah, we're going to hit that hard as well, that if no action is taken, it should be approved. But I mean, the Transportation Commission ought to be compelled to, to make a decision on the record. If we're going to go through the effort to put on the record why we think a project should be given a waiver, why it uh, uh, you know still qualifies and meets the intent and does reduce emissions, or maybe doesn't reduce them, but it's necessary for our region for other reasons that are um, that are required. Then we we think the commission ought to you know give the region uh, the benefit of actually taking a vote on it and not just dodge it. All right, especially safety projects. Yeah. And then last and final slide. This is Dr. Cog's take on uh, the the waiver process. And they had a little different take, which is, um, can CDOT get waivers again? Because remember, anything CDOT does in your region counts against you, not against CDOT. So if, if we say, hey, Dr. Cog, we're going to do PPRTA projects, can CDOT go, well, we're going to get a waiver from the Transportation Commission? You know, I'm not sure that how big of a problem this is, because again, it's, it's up. We still have control over what goes into our TIP and what goes into our long range plan. Uh, but I think Dr. Cog saw the, the political side of this, that things could be forced in. And if they're forced in, um, they could, the CDOT could also do waivers. So I just wanted to bring that out, but that concludes our slide and our discussion. Anybody have anything on the waiver uh, first? And then if there's no questions on waiver, we'll open it up to anything that we've, we've said or have not said uh, that you'd all like to chat, chat about. We'll take the awkward silences, nothing on this particular thing. And now we'll go to the sort of the bigger topic of any comments at all um, on the, the, the topic of GHG and the letter writing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I was either really confusing and I totally messed this up or so spot on, no one has any questions. Too much information for Monday morning. Um, we're gonna, as John emphasized, we're gonna approach this from you know, a practical standpoint as far as how this may work or, or not work based on the examples that we've um, given and we'll draft up uh, 
a list of what those issues and, and concerns are based on what we just uh, talked about. And we'll probably get that out to our, our board just for their review. Um, still not sure what that's gonna look like if it's um, if, if some of these are delivered during the public hearing on September 24th. Um, they'll certainly make their way into the, the final written record that has to be submitted by October 15th. Um, but if anybody has any other concerns or observations that come along, um, feel free to... Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Donaldson, go ahead. Um, yeah, first, thank you. I'm gonna have to get going, but thank you uh, for the presentation. I, it was very helpful for me. And then can you just go through real briefly just the timeline of, of uh, you know important things that are gonna happen in this process? There's the October 15th date and then following that, uh, and not in a lot of detail, but just sure. uh, the next few uh, events, thanks. Yep. Uh, thank you. And actually, um, this reminds me that that you know uh, Victoria had said something about that, and I put it in the uh, TAC memo, but I didn't put it a slide here. So I apologize for that because it was brought to my attention. We needed to provide that. But uh, yeah, I think the at this point, uh, the written uh, public comments is open now uh, until October fifteenth. The um, uh, public hearing here in El Paso County uh, at, Cal at the uh, Quail Loop uh, CDOT Region 2 office um, is on the uh, Friday the 24th and is from September 24th from 4 to 6, 3 to 6, excuse me. Um, and uh, so you can, you can attend uh, in person or virtually, if you attend virtually, uh, they want you to sign up first. So you have to just got to send an email to CDOT and then they send you a link, I believe. Um, that's it for the, the, the comments. And then after that, it moves into their um, uh, meeting schedule for the um, transportation to commission to take action. Did I forget something, Andy? Well, no, so November is the uh, key uh, month when the TC is going to take action on the final rule. I, I don't know that exact date. It's around November 18th, I think. Yeah, I, I will mention that uh, Commissioner um, Williams, along with some others at the stack, uh, pushed for a 30-day uh, extension. Uh, that would be taken up uh, sooner than later, so we would know about that, I think, at the, um, the next uh, TC meeting. Uh, but uh, I think the stack did uh, uh, make a motion to support that as a whole. So between Stack and others, uh, North Front Range has asked for a 30-day extension. Uh, and since it's North Front Range and Dr. Cog, and, and to some extent CDOT, uh, are the reasons the rule is being rushed because that way they get the rule in sufficient amount of time so they can do everything they're supposed to do uh, by that uh, April 1st of 2022 deadline. So, yeah. um, so if the people who are affected most are asking for 30-day, hopefully people will support that. Um, and we certainly have here at PPACG. And, and if you could, could you just repeat the location of the uh, public hearing on the 24th? Where is that going to be? Um, it's at the CDOT Region 2 office on a Quail Loop. Let's, a oh, Quail Lake Loop. I was just seeing if uh, someone from CDOT local is still on the line. I thought I saw Rick Samora, but. And we'll send out the address and uh, how to get there. Pretty yeah. easy to find. We'll make sure everybody has that. Exactly. And just to, should mention too, you know, we, we kind of agree with the need, I obviously agree with the need to reduce emissions. And we've been consistent about saying this and, you know, we'd love to reduce uh, peak hour traffic congestion and provide better, safer travel options for everybody. Those are, that, those are things we try to do in our long range plan and uh, proving projects in our tip um, all the time. I mean, that's, that's what we do as far as our, our long range plan. Um, our, our concerns are just how this is being approached with um, uh, hitting targets for emissions reduction using a, a modeling exercise, which is an imperfect tool, trying to for forecast an uncertain future. We just, we feel that there's some real concerns um, and it's a little bit misplaced as far as how to achieve what, um, what the state thinks they're gonna achieve through this effort. So um, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on our practical concerns about how this may work or, or not work and hopefully end up with a, a better process, better, better product when it uh, finally does get approved. Any other comments, suggestions, questions?
Nice job, John. Right. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. I, I feel like we, we should be on a radio show. <laughs> well, thanks for tuning in there, uh, Colorado Springs, and I hope you all drive safely. Thanks all. Have a good day. Appreciate it. Take care.